Welcome to you all. I'm Patrick Malloy. I'm the Dean of this cathedral. And on behalf of all of us who gather here day by day and week by week, and of all the Episcopalians in the Diocese of New York, we welcome you to our cathedral. In April, Ms. Didion's closest family and her closest friends came here and together we placed her earthly remains in the cathedral columbarium just as about as soon as we could after the pandemic allowed it. She left very clear directions about what she wanted to happen at that service. She wanted it to be very brief and she specified the texts that she wanted us to use, all from the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer, which is what you would expect from an Episcopalian who wrote a book called A Book of Common Prayer. The texts that she chose were remarkably dour, actually. Uh, of all of the texts that one could choose from our prayer book for funeral, she chose some of the most heavy. What's interesting about the text that she chose, though, is that she did not want them to be from what actually is our Book of Common Prayer, the prayer book that we adopted in 1979, a prayer book with all of the these and thous and seths wrung out of it. She wanted the texts that she remembered from the 1928 Book of Common Prayer, where all of that Elizabethan language was still intact. Soon after Quintana died, an article appeared, an interview article in the, in the Los Angeles Times, and they asked Ms. Didion about her religious belief. And she said that she really wasn't religious. She didn't believe in a personal God, uh, but she did believe in a God that was like geology. You know it exists, and you know it has an impact on your life, but essentially, it doesn't know you or really care much about you. And that's not a surprising thing for someone to say who had endured the things in her life she had endured. What's interesting, though, is nonetheless, she wanted a funeral using the words that she remembered in her youth and that had seen her through her life. The thing about the words uh, in our liturgy, we Episcopalians, is that the, the meaning of the words the literal meaning of the words is important to us. But what's just as important to us, I think, is the rhythm of the words, the sounds of the words. And the meaning of the words is more than the meaning of the words for us. It's not merely a matter of individual words meaning individual things, but the pattern of words conveying truly things that are beyond our ken. And so I understood why she would want the words that she remembered. Not that the modern words meant anything different. They don't mean anything different. They're the, the same. But the rhythms do mean something different. And they carry with them a reality that the mere meaning of words cannot possibly convey. And so this evening, we will hear many words about Ms. Didion and about people's relationship with her that will convey more than the words themselves will convey. Words that in their rhythm and in their delivery will convey love and respect and all sorts of things that they could never convey if they were just words on a page. And so this is a, a holy and a solemn occasion. And we at the cathedral, all of us, are very grateful that you are with us tonight and we are honored that you are here, and we are honored that you have entrusted us with the earthly remains of your beloved Joan Didion Dunn.
Good afternoon. On behalf of the Didion Dunn family and Penguin Random House, I want to welcome and thank you all for being here today and also express our enormous gratitude to the speakers and the musicians, some of whom have traveled great distances, and let me add, through terrible traffic, to join us to honor the life and work of Joan Didion. It seems fitting to celebrate Joan's life in this cathedral that she loved. Place was central to her work. New York, California. In spare, powerful sentences, she could conjure a world. Joan Didion had a penetrating gaze as a writer and a reporter, and she was fearless. Joan was part sage, part prophet, always prescient about our culture, who got the 60s to the present day exactly right, whose incisive, fierce writing about the hollowness of our politics here and abroad is timeless, and whose hardwired chill was offset by her closet romanticism whose deeply personal, raw portrayal of loss and grief continues to speak to us. Few writers have more devoted readers. So today, we gather as some of them, as stand-ins for the many. Thank you. When my Uncle John brought his fiance to meet my parents for the first time, my father was a nervous wreck. John and Joan were coming for lunch by our pool, and Dad fussed over the table like he was expecting visiting royalty. Run River had recently been released, which my mother devoured in one sitting. He told me at the age of seven that his future sister-in-law was a real writer not like the hacks he worked with in television. When John and Joan arrived, my brother and sister, Alex and Dominique, we all fell into position according to our size, like we were the Von Trapps meeting our nanny for the first time. When Dominique curtsied and my brother and I bowed, Joan giggled, thinking it was a joke, which it was not. She wore sunglasses and had a warm smile. I noticed that she was not much taller than me and just as skinny. I was too young to be interested in girls, but I remember thinking, should I ever have a girlfriend, I wanted her to look like Aunt Joan. At about that moment, a seam in my swimming trunks exposed my privates, and John and Joan thought it was hilarious. As they roared with laughter, John, Joan just looked at me as if to say, I'm not with those guys. And even as a little boy, I understood that this was a woman who would never be swayed by public opinion. From my earliest teens, <clears throat> Joan always thought to include me in the rarefied company of people they invited to for dinner parties at their cr crumbling villa just steps from gritty Hollywood Boulevard and later at their house in Malibu. One summer, they gave a party for Tom Wolfe to celebrate his newly released Kool-Aid acid test. And when Joan in called to invite my mother, she asked, said, bring Griffin along because she knew what a huge fan I was. And the next morning, she and mom rehashed the party on the phone. And Joan asked her to put me on to hear what I thought. I told her I had a great time, even though I never got to meet Janice. And no one talked to me except the guy from Hogan's Heroes. She said, wait a minute, and yelled to John to pick up from his office. Okay, when, when he did, she said, okay, start over. 
So I told them that the guy who played Colonel Klimt had taken acid and was having a really bad trip and wouldn't let me leave his side. And every time I'd try to get away, he'd pull me down, he wouldn't let me leave. He just would just say, you must, not, you must stay, you must stay, I'm having Zabama. And when John and Joan's laughter died down, they pointed out that the Nazi on acid wasn't Colonel Klimt, but the film director, Otto Preminger. And I didn't know, I didn't know who that was, but I later found out he was famous for almost burning Jean Seberg to death during Joan of Arc so we can get fear in her eyes. So I guess I got up pretty easy. That film, the first film I ever directed was about that party. And I think it was one of the reasons Joan let me make a documentary about her and the time she wrote about. Working with her remains one of the highlights of my life. Though on camera, Joan and I plunged in, into some pretty desperately sad subjects. Uh, we had a ball making it. You know, when Joan was a little girl, she was torn between being a marine biologist and an actress. But when she was here, we were shooting right here in St. John's, she was an actress. We had to do several takes of her walking down this very aisle. And she understood the shot, hit her marks, and found the light every time. When we wrapped one location, Joan would pile into the van with the crew to rush to the next one. I can't tell you how happy she was. She loved being part of a collective vision the camaraderie of everyone working toward the same purpose. She loved the lunch breaks that we grabbed on the run in coffee shops, and my young crew could not get over if they were having chicken salad with Joan Didion. When the movie premiered at the New York Film Festival at Lincoln Center, it received a seven-minute standing ovation. The ovation wasn't for the film, it was for her, for her years of brilliant writing, for surviving unbearable heartbreak, and for always moving forward, just like her ancestors who fought Apaches, fought off Apaches and starvation while crossing the plains to finally settle in the Sacramento Valley. The love the audience showed, showered on Joan that night, was for always exhibiting, to use her words, a certain toughness, a kind of moral nerve, for displaying what was once called character. And I got to see that character all my life. How lucky am I? Good afternoon. Uh, we are gathered here to celebrate a shared sincerity. We have a common sincere purpose to commemorate the life and the work and the wonderful example of Joan and especially for what she taught us. Her life and her writings and her deep commitment to finding the truth are why we join together here and why we have this common sincerity in celebrating. We celebrate what she taught us. Joan taught us to prepare for a filling life, fulfilling life, and her writings still teach us that. Joan taught us that to lead a fulfilling life, we must learn about the world around us. But there's, there's a necessary first step, and it is this. Each of us must learn who we are. Uh, before this, discussing this, this, this further, uh, let me return to our shared childhood years. And it's for that reason that you've been so gracious to invite me 
Uh, were I to talk about literary criticism, Joan would quickly call down that I'm way out of my, uh, my proper realm. Uh, my earliest uh, memories of, of Joan date back to the early 1940s in, in, in Sacramento. Uh, Sacramento is where we were both from. Um, from the time they were five or six years old, Joan and my sister Nancy were good friends. Uh, they became one another's closest best friends uh, when they were in the same class in high school. Uh, we lived um, much nearer to the high school than Joan did, uh, so she came to our house after school all the time on a regular basis. Uh, she often stayed for dinner and sometimes overnight. Nancy and Joan were, were two years ahead of me um, in school, uh, but we did many things together. It escaped me at the time, only in my college years beginning to look back, did it become clear to me that even then, Joan began to teach me that we must learn who we are. It, it, uh, it would be of no surprise to you that Joan spent most of her time after school uh, editing her articles for the high school newspaper and her essays for the class. Uh, she and my sister Nancy would talk about uh, themes that Joan had in mind. Then Joan would think and write and think and write all over again and think and write all over again. Well, many of you know the drill. Uh, our family worked hard at writing. We were proud of our writing skills. But even then, even in high school, my sister Nancy pointed out to us that Joan wrote at a higher level. When the writing and the, and the homework ended, uh, their other friends would come by and Joan would share in the fun and, and, and the laughter. Yet she was still pensive and happy and happy in, in, in being so. It's good to remember as well that Joan always kept notebooks. Um, she jotted down her ideas and, and would go at once to the notebook after a dinner or a social conversation to write out the exact words of a conversation. And she told me that this helped her in knowing what conversation sounded like so that her writing would be more compelling if she were repeating or uh, imagining a, a conversation. Looking back on those high school years during my college days, it became clear to me that Joan all but defined herself by seeking to learn more about who she was. Uh, by her example, she taught me, and she still teaches us, uh, that whether or not we're writers, we must seek deeper insights into ourselves day to day, day after day, year to year, year after year. Uh, Joan knew right from the start that only by asking herself this question could her writing be uh, more free from hidden bias, more free from self-interest, more free from those mistaken assumptions that obscure facts or blur ideas. Ref reflecting long and carefully to define ourselves, to know ourselves better might sound egocentric or self-centered, uh, and surely the process can go that, that way if our purpose in knowing ourselves is to enhance our own self-esteem or to impress others. But this was far from Joan's goal. Uh, for if anyone lived with humility, it was Joan. She, taught him, she sought to know herself so others would be enriched by her example of searching always for honesty in all that we do. The virtue of learning who we are is, is hardly a new insight. Uh, the inscription on the uh, temple at Delphi, uh, 400 BC, um, is know thyself. And the very first line in Hamlet is who's there? Uh, and later, of course, when, in Shakespeare, when Polonius surprises us by a, a moment of wisdom, uh, he says, to thine own self, be true. I use thine because Joan liked the older words rather than your. To thine own self be true. 
when it's my privilege to administer the oath of office to a new judge, my advice is this. In each and every ruling, you must, you must ask yourself, why am I doing this? Who am I? You may find that your earlier motives, my advice to the judges is, you, you might find that your earlier motives or assumptions were too hasty, too, supervis too superficial. And Joan asked herself this suggestion all through her life lifetime. And as many of you will know, her writing gave new insights. She and John loved California. Yet as she wrote about it, where I was from particularly, and her life there, she was all but stunned by the assumptions she had made about history and the purpose of those who shaped the state in the years before us. When Joan and John lived in Hawaii for a time, it was my pleasure to visit them once or twice. And my question to Joan once was, are you still east of Eden? Um, she, uh, Joan was always looking for Eden. She knew probably that she couldn't find it. Uh, but her writing shared with us that search. Our family sometimes visited uh, our own relatives in Marin County. And when Joan was close by, just across uh, the bay at, at UC Berkeley, she would sometimes join us on weekends, join with the family. Uh, and one, one weekend, we drove to a nearby redwood forest and Joan leaned back up against the tree. In answer to my teasing comment that the tree was just a little bit taller than Joan, Joan said, yes, but we are still tall enough to save these trees for generations yet to come. Now, this, this was in the 50s, uh, when the public discourse was less instructive about the environment but Joan's insight, once more, taught us that by learning more about our own faults and strengths, we can find the potential to help others. Joan asked hard questions of herself and her readers. She had many deep griefs, and she candidly shared them to open our hearts and to affirm our human vulnerability. In 1982, June uh, uh, Joan helped me frame, because I walked her in June. Joan helped me frame and understand the loss of my sister. Um, as we join here together in this shared sincerity to celebrate Joan's life and her work, we pray she has gone to a place of eternal rest. One might imagine that her beloved John is already enjoying taking the celestial telephone calls so that Joan has time to reflect. Um, and we know that, and we pray that she has joined her beloved husband and her beloved Quintana. Uh, this, this occasion gives me the opportunity uh, to thank all of you in the writing profession and in the public uh, and in the publication business for helping to honor and preserve what Joan Wright, what Joan wrote, and what she still teaches us, what she wrote and what she teaches us for now and for generations yet to come. Thank you. I'm sorry I can't be with you. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person to speak about my friend Joan Divian, but I'm here in California, her other home. Day one, post balloons. That's how Joan inscribed her book after Henry, which she gave me the day after the balloons dropped and the Democrats finished their 1992 convention. And those four words for me, captured Joan and the moment itself, the superficial excitement of the convention, the silly balloons dropping, but also a beginning, the first day of something more promising, more real. 
I first met Joan and John at their Malibu home in the 70s, but I didn't get to know her until she invited me to stay at her New York apartment for those days when I was in New York City during my presidential campaign. I'd made it a practice in that campaign of avoiding hotels and staying in the homes of friends and supporters. I knew about Joan because my sister Barbara got to know her at the Tri-Delta sorority in Berkeley in 1953. My sister majored in English like Joan and wrote for the Daily Cal. She and Joan would share a smoke together and talk about the novels they're reading. Years later, my sister's most vivid memory is that of Joan coming down for breakfast in a pink Chanel robe, drinking a cup of coffee and smoking cigarettes. Joan said she was influenced by Mark Shore, as was my sister. That made me think of my own experience in Professor Shore's literature class. On that last day, as he finished his final lecture, he took a long drag on his cigarette, exhaled slowly, and intoned, this class ends on the downbeat. That is just the way it is. And he turned and walked slowly off the raised platform into an L hall and out the door. That stark view struck me as revelatory, as an authoritative statement of the age, as the new dispensation that would now replace the one I'd left behind at the Sacred Heart Novitiate the year before. Because it has stayed with me all these years, I wondered if similar sentiments also touched Joan and influenced her understanding of what she called the whole grand pattern of human endeavor. We stand, she told the graduates at UC Riverside, on the brink of something every day we get out of bed that usually turns out to be a precipice. In that same 1975 commencement address, she spoke so frankly about her own life. And I quote, I've had to struggle all my life against my own misapprehension, my own false ideas, my own distorted perception. I've had to work very hard, make myself unhappy, give up the ideas that made me comfortable, trying to apprehend social reality. I spent my entire adult life, it seems to me, in a state of profound culture shock. That same year, following eight years of Ronald Reagan, I moved to Sacramento for my own time as governor of California. And I chose to live in an apartment rather than the new governor's mansion that Nancy Reagan had built. Nancy said the old mansion that had housed every governor since 1903 was now a fire trap and no longer suitable. Actually, that was not true. It was a perfectly fine house, the most splendid Victorian mansion in all of Sacramento. Joan spent some time there as a young girl when Earl Warren was governor. His daughter Nina was a year ahead of her at McClatchy High School. Joan said the old governor's mansion was my favorite house in the world. I spent many happy years when my father was governor and later lived in it during my last years of my own governorship. But it was the new mansion that really caught Joan's attention. In her famous essay, Many Mansions, she said it was a house built for a family of snackers. It was a case study in the architecture of limited possibilities and is devoid of privacy or personal eccentricity as the lobby area in a Ramada Inn. It's the kind of house in which one does not live. Joan ended her essay with these haunting words. I've seldom seen a house so evocative of the unspeakable. From her own sense of her forebears, from that earlier time in California of straight-talking, hard-living pioneers, Joan crafted her own unique sensibility of distance and biting clarity. She was gentle in person and quiet-spoken, but fierce in her honesty. And going back to that day in Riverside, her words then could stand now as a fitting epitaph. And I quote, I'm talking about trying not to be crippled by ideas. I'm talking about looking out, about looking out at the world and trying to see it straight, about making that effort to look out for the whole rest of your life. Joan Didion was a Californian, all right. She was gentle 
and she was fierce. Sadly, very sadly, we won't be seeing the likes of her again, ever. Thank you. It's an honor to be here tonight and to honor Joan Didion. I've been asked to read two poems. The first selection is by me, uh, and it's called The Mission. It remembers a time in San Francisco where I first read Didion, and it ends with a line from Emily Dickinson, whom I wear never lived in California, but appears in the poem nonetheless. In rereading The Year of Magical Thinking recently, I was struck by how much poetry features in her grieving, from Cummings to Hopkins to Auden, and just how much this poem thinks about what she says there about the difference between mourning and grief. Grief, when it comes, she says, is nothing we expect it to be. Grief is different. Grief has no distance. This is the mission. Back there then, I lived across the street from a home for funerals. Afternoons, I'd look out the shades and think of the graveyard behind Emily Dickinson's house. How death was no concept, but soul after soul, she washed pour into the cold New England ground. Maybe it was the son of the mission. Maybe just being more young, but it was less disquiet than comfort, days the street filled with cars for a wake. Children played tag out front while the bodies snuck in the back. The only hint of death, those clusters of cars, lights low as talk, idling dark as the secondhand suits that fathers or sons, now orphans, had rescued out of closets, praying they still fit. Most did. Most laughed despite themselves, shook hands, and grew hungry out of habit, evening coming on again. The home's clock broke like a bone, always read three. Mornings or dead of night, I wondered who slept there and wrote letters I later forgot I sent my father. Now find buoyed up among the untidy tide of his belongings. He kept everything but alive. I have come to know sorrows, not noun, but verb, something that unlike living by doing right, you do less of. The sun is too bright. Your eyes adjust, become like the night. Hands covering the face, its numbers, dark and unmoving, unlike the cars that fill and start to edge out. Quiet, cortege, crawling, half dim, till I could not see to see. And this is William Butler Yeats, The Second Coming which, as you know, helps title Slouching Towards Bethlehem. The second coming, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi trembles, troubles my sight somewhere in the sands of the desert a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs, while all about it 
real shadows of the indignant desert birds, the darkness drops again. But now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. So how do you go about speaking at a memorial service for someone who was in her time the foremost enemy of cant, cliché, and falsehood? Well, the least you can do is start by being honest. And if I'm being honest, I was rarely fortunate enough to publish Joan Didion. When Joan took time to write for magazines, and she almost always did so brilliantly, daringly, and with an overwhelming sense of security for Bob Silvers at the New York Review of Books. But of course, Bob is among the missing today, and when it comes to the world of Joan Didion, the cathedral is crowded with ghosts. Bob, Barbara Epstein, Jason Epstein, Henry Robbins, Susan Sontag, Nora Ephron, Toni Morrison, Brian Moore, and many more, and of course, John and Quintana, all startlingly gone. When Joan died last December, just before Christmas, it was hard to receive the news as a shock. It wasn't merely that she was 87 and in failing health. Who could lay a greater claim to exhaustion? To read the year of magical thinking, both what it did describe and what the author couldn't bear to include, is to encounter an infinitely strong human being at the end of the line. And yet so many readers and so many writers absorbed the news of Joan's death as a kind of devastation. The reason is clear. Is there an essayist today who is more universally admired by young readers and fledgling writers? Slouching toward Bethlehem and the White Album in particular reaches young people with an emotional and intellectual immediacy that is, in my experience anyway, incomparable. These days, maybe James Baldwin is the only essayist I can think of who has that kind of immediate and electrifying effect across the board. At The New Yorker, when I, was asked, when I asked some writers to respond to Joan's death, no one refused. Hilton Isles wrote, Isles wrote beautifully about it. Zadie Smith answered my email in the middle of the night with an immediate and passionate essay that seemed to speak for so many of those young readers. When women writers of my generation speak in awed tones of Didion's style, I don't think it's the shift dresses or the sunglasses, the cigarettes or the commas, or even the M dashes that we revere, even though all those things were fabulous, Zadie wrote. It was the authority, the authority of tone. There is much in Didion one might disagree with personally, politically, aesthetically, I will never love the doors, but I remain grateful for the day I picked up slouching toward Bethlehem and realized that a woman could speak without making nice, without hedging her bets, without hemming and hawing, without poeticisms, without sounding pleasant or sweet, without deference, and even without doubt. It must be hard for a young woman today to imagine the sheer scope of things that women of my generation feared women could not do. But believe me, writing authority was one of them. When Joan wrote about the grotesque injustice of the young man known in the tabloids as the Central Park Five, she didn't so much unearth new facts as scrutinize the available facts. And through the unfailing clarity of her mind, her moral sense, 
and her absolute fearlessness, she saw things plain as so many others had not. And what to say of her instrument, her exacto knife that was her prose? Many writers have tried to imitate and even parody her sentences. I wish them all good luck. She is inimitable. In late 1998, just a few months after starting my job, I learned what it is to receive a colossal and undeserved editorial gift. Joan, D Joan Didion sent an essay called Last Words to the magazine. The piece explored the opening four sentences of A Farewell to Arms. By then, Hemingway, for all the reasons you know, was an unfashionable writer, more or less brand banished from the curriculum. If he was still of any interest, it was for the trespasses of his biography. Didion, who spoke candidly about the influence of far more expansive writers, George Eliot, Henry James, Emily Bronte, made it clear that she had studied Hemingway's sentences the way a young artist surveys a Rembrandt, its nuances and its brushstrokes. In her essay, she took a magnifying glass to Hemingway's opening passage as if to illustrate the attention that real reading and real writing demands. That paragraph, which was published in 1929, she wrote, bears examination. Four deceptively simple sentences, 126 words, the arrangement of which remains as mysterious and thrilling to me now as it did when I first read them at 12 or 13. And imagine that if I studied them closely enough and practiced hard enough, I might one day arrange 126 words myself. Only one of the words has three syllables. 22 have two. The other 103 have one. 24 of the words are the. 15 are and. There are four commas. The liturgical cadence of the paragraph derives in part from the placement of the commas, their presence in the second and fourth sentences, their absence in the first and the third, but also from that repetition of the and uh, and creating a rhythm so pronounced that the omission of the before the word leaves in the fourth sentence, and we saw the troops marching along the road and the dust rising and leaves stirred by the breeze falling that casts exactly what was meant to be, a chill, a premonition, a foreshadowing of the story to come, the awareness that the author has already shifted his attention from late summer to a darker season. This is an artist giving us a glimpse of her own practice, her values, her exactitude. And what is left behind, she was telling us, is not the celebrity of an artist, not running with the bulls at Pamplona or kneeling beside a deadline on the Serengeti Plain, and not for that matter the shift dresses and the sunglasses and the adventures in Hollywood. When I think about Joan Didion, I think of her particular music, the powers of her memory and her concentration, her risks and her honesty, the unblinking deliberation she used to help us see the world more clearly and unforgettably. And I, thought, and I think of all those young readers, and we were once young readers too, who have been changed by their encounters with this recessive seeming person, this immense spirit, this voice. As some of you may know, Joan was an eccentric, or perhaps it is more judicious to say that she was set in her ways, ways which would not be considered conventional. There was, to paraphrase Robert Lowell, something about her both enchanting and reproachful. For example, she rarely answered the telephone. 
and she rarely made telephone calls. I spoke to her many times on the phone, but not because she called me or I called her. John used the telephone often, calling different friends every day to report, or better still, to hear some gossip or news. If I began to tell him something which he knew would amuse her, he would interrupt me to call out, Babe, pick up! And a few seconds later, Joan would come on the line. I could tell from the sound of her voice that she was already smiling. And although she was loyal and trustworthy, uncorrupted and punctilious, she was not particularly solicitous. Still, it was easeful to sit with her, even if we did not speak. Her silence was a refuge which I often preferred to conversation, but there was tension beneath the calm, a form of homesickness for California, perhaps, even when she was in California. And while she seldom resorted to making jokes herself, she liked to laugh, having a subtle understanding of the specificity that makes something funny. What really had her attention was irony, which could sometimes make her seem disdainful. But then irony is a kind of disdain. There is often a moral in it, too, if you know where to look. While she had very determined views, many of which she revealed only in her writing, she had no interest in shaping one's character. Very rarely, she would say something helpful in nature if I asked her advice, although I often missed her meaning until I had thought about what she had said. When I gave her the manuscript of my first book to read, filling her with dread, as she later admitted, she told me that she thought it would do. I was, of course, relieved and pleased. She then said, now write it again, which surprised and irritated me, although I did as I was told. There were other clues over the years, but very few. One night, a friend unexpectedly brought Bianca Jagger to dinner at the house in Trancas. Bianca chose to spend the evening looking through some magazines she found on a table. I had rarely seen Joan so angry. When everyone had left and we were washing glasses and emptying ashtrays, she turned to me and said, evil is the absence of seriousness, nothing more. Another time I was defending a woman who had behaved erratically, reminding Joan that the woman was often original and seldom uninteresting when she interrupted me to say, crazy is never interesting. The writer Brian Moore read her novel Democracy in Manuscript and told me that it was based on my family in Hawaii. I was startled by this, but when I somewhat naively asked her if this was true, she did not bother to answer me. The next day, however, she said, I would drop this whole idea of knowing the truth. Over time, I learned to read her gestures and expressions, studying her as if she were a rune of mysterious and magical significance, which of course she was. When she learned from John that I was hoping to find a friend who had disappeared, I could see that she thought it a fruitless endeavor. For once, I pressed her, but all she said was, Whatever you do, you'll regret both. 
When I suddenly moved from Los Angeles to London in the late 70s without having told her that I was leaving, she sent me a note containing only two sentences. One of them was, read the golden bowl. The other was, stop running away. So not much direct or specific instruction over almost 60 years of intimacy, but as it turned out, enough to get me through. Evil is the absence of seriousness. Drop the whole idea of knowing the truth. Whatever you do, you'll regret both. Crazy is never interesting. Stop running away and write it again. Joan Didion, the year of magical thinking, signed at Book Soup in Los Angeles, long ago. Films are often made from books, and one of Joan and John's film scripts was based on one of her books. Perhaps I'm even forgetting another one. But when a book turns into a play, that's very seldom. And this particular time came when David Hare convinced Scott Rudin a tremendously good theater producer to finance a workshop in 2006, March 2006. And Joan and David Hare chose an actress, Linda Amond. Perhaps you're here today, Linda, I don't know. And then, in March, we opened at the booth. Maybe that's when we had our first preview, three weeks of previews. And then, we opened at the booth. And then, a year later, we did a little United Kingdom tour. And then we opened at the National Theater in May 2008. And that's something that meant the world to Joan. Because John and Quintana had died. Joan was sitting in the wings or in the rehearsal room for every performance of the year of magical thinking. Every one. She'd have a little table and a little electric candle and either the stage management or one of jo Joan's assistants would bring in her supper and she would have it at the table, little round cafe table with a little cafe chair 
in what we call in the theater, the wings. It's a nice word, isn't it? The wings. And there's that rose window, which is also there in the book. I'm going to read to you now the very last page. Two and a half pages. From the book and from the play. I think you'll have gathered what David Hare gave to Joan and Scott Rudin. The only kind of happiness that could fill her again after the death of John and Quintana. I realize as I write this that I do not want to finish this account, nor did I want to finish the year. The craziness is receding, but no clarity is taking its place. I look for resolution and find none. I did not want to finish the year because I know that as the days pass, as January becomes February and February becomes summer, certain things will happen. My image of John at the instant of his death will become less immediate, less raw. It will become something that happened in another year. My sense of John himself, John alive, will become more remote, even mudgy, softened transmuted into whatever best serves my life without him. In fact, this is already beginning to happen. All year I've been keeping time for last year's calendar, what we were doing on this day last year. Where did we have dinner? Is it the day a year ago we flew to Honolulu after Quintana's wedding? Is it the day a year ago we flew back from Paris? Is it the day... I realize today for the first time that my memory of this day a year ago is a memory that does not involve John. This day a year ago was December the 31st, 2003. John did not see this day a year ago. John was dead. I was crossing Lexington Avenue when this occurred to me. I know why we try to keep the dead alive. We try to keep them alive in order to keep them with us. I also know that if we are to live ourselves, there comes a point at which we must relinquish the dead, let them go, keep them dead. Let them become the photograph on the table. Let them become the name on the trust accounts. Let go of them in the water. In fact, the apprehension that our life together will increasingly be the center of my every day seemed today on Lexington Avenue, so distinct a betrayal that I lost all sense of oncoming traffic.
I think about leaving the lay at St. John the Divine. A souvenir of the Christmas in Honolulu when we filled the screen with blue. During the years when people still left Honolulu on the mats and lines, the custom at the moment of departure was to throw lays on the water, a promise that the traveler would return. The lays would get caught in the wake and go bruised and brown, the way the gardenias in the pool filter at the house in Brentwood Park had gone bruised and brown. The other morning when I woke, I tried to remember the arrangement of the rooms in the house in Brentwood Park. I imagined myself walking through the rooms, first on the ground floor, then on the second. Later in the day, I realized I'd forgotten one. The lay I left at St. John the Divine would have gone brown by now. Lays go brown. Tectonic plates shift. Deep currents move. Islands vanish. Rooms get forgotten. I flew into Indonesia and Malaysia and Singapore with John in 1979 and 1980. Some of the islands that were there then would now be gone, just shallows. I think about swimming with him into the cave at Portuguese Bends, about the swell of clear water the way it changed, the swiftness and power it gained as it narrowed through the rocks at the base of the point. The tide had to be just right. We had to be in the water at the very moment the tide was right. We could only have done this a half dozen times at most during the two years we lived there but it is what I remember. Each time we did it, I was afraid of missing the swell, hanging back, timing it wrong. John never was. You had to feel the swell change. You had to go with the change. He told me that. No eye is on the sparrow, but he did tell me that.
For writers of my generation, Joan Didion has famously become a symbol, a sort of shorthand for style and influence and eminence and absolute authority. This iconographic turn is in some ways inevitable. No other writer's work stands like hers does. Her words as immortal and immutable as a monument, even as they still flash and sway and tremble, utterly potent, unstable, and alive. But it's always seemed to me that to turn Joan Didion into an emblem is to misrepresent a woman so averse to reflexive adulation or sentimentality, and to contravene her fundamental project, her clairvoyant disassembling of overprecious myth. Didion's genius lay in seeing the gleam of a narrative and finding the dissolution underneath it, the violence and deception and beauty that whispered through. You wish you could read her now, on the dread and anime of our present, on the melting pavement, the taps running black in Jackson, Mississippi, the bodies washing up in Lake Mead, the undrinkable rainwater, the angry hordes at the Capitol, the sinkholes of conspiracy, the grief, the severance of reality, the performance of authority, the tankers breaking down in the Suez Canal. We want a Didion roadmap, a sentence that contains the country's entire weather. We long for the resolve, the clarity, the premonition, and the strength modeled in each of her lines. So profound is this legacy that the literary world has been searching explicitly and shamelessly for her replacement but there will never, ever be another Joan Didion. There's only the question for writers who follow behind her in time or in form or in intention of what of hers you might emulate and what of hers you might write against in countervailing motion to. It's a question that you reckon with even if you've never read her. So embedded is her work in the writerly unconscious. I delayed reading Joan Didion until well into my 20s because I had a sense which proved to be accurate that through the words of others, I had already been reading her for my entire life. Once I did read her, I saw instantly the inheritance, the piece of gold that I and so many others would hope to lay hands on, to borrow from a writer not known for her permissiveness. In her work, I understood simply for the first time that it was possible to write about the world armed with only your own perception that even if you had nothing but your eye and the precision with which you could translate what it lingered on, that even if you were bound by your specific human limitations, fated to reveal them over and over, even if you were stunned, even if we all looked like such miniature figures against the centrifugal forces of history and frustrated desire, even if all you could hear some nights were the ice cubes clinking, that you would be freed plainly and terrifyingly and thrillingly and infinitely, if you could only be close and relentless and merciless in that sense of instinct and vision, one phrase, one image, one thought at a time. Reading Didion, I understood that in doing this, a writer could summon a kind of might and prerogative that the world would never have granted her otherwise, that she could call the world into being on paper and give her words the weight of stone. The Joan Didion line I think about the most often is this one. Had I been blessed with even limited access to my own mind, she wrote, there would have been no reason to write. I write entirely to find out what I'm thinking, what I'm looking at, what I see, and what it means, what I want and what I fear. What a gift this disclosure is, that a writer of Didion's unfathomable and singular power could simply look for the things that shimmered, as she put it, shimmered with some unseen presence, that she could record them, and that could be it, that, in her hands at least, that could be everything. Thank you. We all come from somewhere, and the voices we rely on to tell us where that somewhere is or was 
and how we did or did not function in it are generally writers' voices, those brilliant, uneasy recorders devoted to dismantling any preoccupation we may have about place, about the family, about home. Skeptical of the body politic in general, and in particular, with its rights and passages, its social laws and communal rights, the writers we return to again and again to explain where we've been or landed or where our country has been are those artists who do not turn away from who we are and why. For my part, I read and reread the poet Elizabeth Bishop, the better to understand displacement, atmosphere, and the longing for the queer home, the essayist and novelist James Baldwin, to understand how cities like New York can break your heart while ghettoizing your soul, and Joan, Joan Didion, who taught me that family was always part of the story, along with place, and how the writer's job was to face the terror, beauty, banality, and truth inherent in being a citizen of both. Always in her fictional work, there was what Elizabeth Hart would call the, quote, disastrous surprises in the mother, father, child tableau, unquote. And those surprises, it seems to me, always ran parallel to politics with its cronyism, makeshift families, fictions, and disasters. Joan, what could she mean when she wrote those stories about children disappearing, stories where lovers and fathers and daughters did unspeakable things to one another, and yet there was still our need for one another, for family, despite all, which gives so, much, which gives so many of her characters a reason to live and dream some more and accounts for the deep pathos in her novels. Looking back, I think Joan, like any great American author, was building a world brick by brick based on the world she knew, a universe founded on home or ideas about home and how it relate, relates to oneself in the larger world. Always, always, she was interested in community, whether in her native Sacramento or in a devastated El Salvador, or in New York with its, quote, lazy criminality, unquote, and destructive narratives about race and women, or in Miami shaped by deals and the drama of exile. Time and again, Joan wrote about who we are and what we are, including how, as a nation, we live in a society peopled by citizens you may be related to or not, but who, are, but who you are bound to in any case because we are Americans. We are all inheritors of a cracked, chaos-filled kingdom, one where the center does not hold, but you can learn something from fracture if only you could face the cracks and fissures, which are the cracks and fissures of history. I've always liked the fact that Joan is the feminine form of John, and who knew her better than her husband, John Gregory Dunn, who wrote in his wonderful book, Monster, Living Off the Big Screen, that Joan was not someone you'd refer to as the little woman. She whom the doctors described in her book about John and grief as a, quote, cool customer. I think Joan's coolness, her not little womanness, has to do with her rejection of what women are often trained to do, to help before criticizing or swallow the criticism altogether. And I thank Joan's mother, Edwin, for encouraging her daughter's skepticism when she gave her five-year-old Joan a writing tablet so she would stop complaining and write her thoughts down. The child who complains is the child who is uneasy with an accepted order. And I like to imagine Joan as a schoolgirl or in a sorority, the pleasant middle-class female joiner in the rights of her class, starting to squirm in her formal, you know, the kind made of sink and tool sometimes, silk and tool sometimes, pink or always white, as she started to not so much march away from the world she had known, but to write it down. That's the first trouble, describing your world and writing it down. Because that means you are thinking, questioning your place in it. And here is Joan describing both in her essay, Notes of a Native Daughter. 
What happened in New York and Washington and abroad seemed to impinge not at all upon the Sacramento mind. I remember being taken to call upon, upon a very old woman, a rancher's widow who was reminiscing the favored con conversational mode in Sacramento about the son of some contemporaries of hers. That Johnson boy never did amount to much, she said. My mother protested. Alva Johnston, she said, had won the Pulitzer Prize when he was working for the New York Times. Our hostess looked at us impassively. He never amounted to anything in Sacramento, she said. <laughs> and so it goes, and so it goes. You mount to something in Sacramento or Zanzibar, or you do not. You're claimed as one of the tribe, or you are not. The point is to look at why these hierarchies exist in the first and second place, and why family is sometimes based on exclusion or whim or longing, and write it down in all its disasters and ideolog ideologies and joys, the better to tell us who you are and why, and why always, despite the facts, you always want, end up wanting to go home to that place, no matter what you call it. Joan was Quintana's mother. I met Quintana in preschool in St. Aidan's in Malibu in 1970. We were four years old. Quintana explained to me that her mother was going to Sacramento to her own parents' house to finish her book. I'm staying at home with my dad, and my parents want to know if you would like to come over after school one of those days. Our parents made the plan. I lived in Malibu Colony, and the Duns lived 12 miles up PCH past Trancus, just below County Line. Malibu was out there in those days, but we all had each other. My family had no ru rules at all, and John and Joan had rules of a particular kind. Like have a Coca-Cola in a glass bottle but only if there are at least two left in the refrigerator in the garage in case Joan gets a migraine. Or come to Earl McGrath's party for the Rolling Stones. We were 14, but Susan, you'll have to spend the night and you'll both skip school the next day as it'll be a late one. Quintana loved the freedom from thinking things through at my house while I loved knowing from Joan and from John that there actually was a plan. We were best friends. We both got an extra set of parents, and our parents were not alone out there in Malibu. We all had each other. Joan and John had a birthday party for Quintana. She was seven. We played on the beach, and when it was time for cake, we walked up the long set of stairs to their house up on the cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean where we sat around the dining room table. Joan placed individual hot chocolate souffles she had just made herself in front of each one of us. Most of the kids in Malibu were not yet familiar with chocolate souffles and started saying things like, ew, gross, disgusting. Quintana and I locked eyes and then turned to Joan for help. She smiled and instantly picked up the large bowl of cold, stiff whipped cream she had just whipped herself and showed each kid, one by one, how to break open their souffle with a spoon to make room for the cream that then melted into the chocolate. The ooh grosses naturally became woes and ooms and yums. Joan knew exactly how to throw a party for Quintana. For years after, John would tease Joan about this day. Out of nowhere, he would throw his arm up into the air. Joan, 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 
And then he'd point right at her, chocolate souffle, chocolate souffle. And we would laugh and laugh. They were so fun to laugh with. And once we'd all stop laughing, Joan would say, I didn't know how to make birthday cake. I knew how to make chocolate souffle. <laughs> Joan and John brought me to Hawaii with them one Christmas. I'd never been away from my family for the holiday. Joan noticed me getting homesick one day. Without raising the issue, she reached out and she stroked my head. What you should know is that your mother told me that the only reason she let you miss Christmas at home was because she thought it would be good for you to know that you could do it without her. And then I was fine. In an instant, Joan had figuratively brought my own mother to Hawaii. She knew just what to say. Quintana wanted to come stay with us for a night or two. Her mom was going to Miami. Maybe Cuba, something about Fidel Castro, Quintana said. I asked Joan, how do you do that? Aren't you afraid of Fidel Castro? Joan smiled at us both and cut the air with her hand. You drink Coca-Cola out of the glass bottle, no ice, to keep your stomach from getting upset. And then you, it's very humid there, so you wear long skirts with no underwear to avoid getting a yeast infection. That's how she did it. After my parents had died, after John had died, and after Quintana had died, I was living in Los Angeles, and I was having some personal issues. I called Joan in New York. I told her I was calling her because no one in LA was awake. In truth, I knew she was the only one who would know what to do. She asked, she asked what was going on. And I talked for well over an hour in the dark on speakerphone as I drove back and forth across Mulholland, as if I were her, by the way. By the time the sun had risen, she'd listened to everything and barely said a word. And then she said, get back to work, Susan. Get to work and then come to New York. In 2007, I called Joan because her dear friend Camilla McGrath had died. I couldn't imagine calling Joan one more time to see if she was all right. So many people had died. So I called her and asked if Earl McGrath, Camilla's husband, was all right. Hi, Susan, Joan said. Earl is only just now beginning to... Earl is only just now beginning to realize that there is a pattern in life. People die. I loved having dinner with John and Joan and Quintana. I loved laughing with them. I loved sitting in their houses and rolling my eyes over all the objects that Joan had carefully placed in the living room or on her desk, objects whose significance was dear mostly to her, like the large marbles that Quintana had given her one Christmas. I love watching them and listening to them, and I love loving them. Joan gave her love endlessly. During a rare silence at dinners in Malibu or Brentwood, or even later years in New York, Joan would take in the gravity of the simple moment that we were all together and that we were all safe. She would grab Quintana's hand, and then she would grab mine. She'd pull us in tight and close her eyes, and then she would sing. Little mousy, little mousy, little mousy, what I love to eat. Mm, I love them mousy feet. And that is true. We'd all laugh, and then Joan's eyes would fill with tears. Ours would too.
I'm going to read from Insider Baseball, which was in the book after Henry. It occurred to me during the summer of 1988 in California and Atlanta and New Orleans in the course of watching first the California primary and then the Democratic and Republican national conventions that it had not been by accident that the people with whom I had preferred to spend time in high school had, on the whole, hung out in gas stations. They had not run for student body office. They had not gone to Yale or Swarthmore, nor had they even applied. They had gotten drafted, gone through basic at Fort Ord. They had knocked up girls and married them, had begun what they called the first night of the rest of their lives with a midnight drive to Carson City and a $5 ceremony performed by a justice still in his pajamas. They got jobs at the places that had laid off their uncles. That's a great sentence. They were never destined to be, in other words, communicants in what we have come to call when we want to indicate the traditional way in which power is exchanged and the status quo maintained in the United States, the process. The process today gives everyone a chance to participate, Tom Hayden, by way of explaining the difference between 1968 and 1988, said to Brian Gumbel on NBC at 7.50 a.m. on the day after Jesse Jackson spoke at the 1988 Democratic Convention in Atlanta. This was at a convention that had as its, as its controlling principle the notably non-participatory idea of unity. Demonstrably not true, but people inside the process, constituting as they do a self-created and self-referring class, a new kind of managerial elite, tend to speak of the world not necessarily as it is, but as they want people out there to believe it is. They tend to prefer the theoretical to the observable and to dismiss that which might be learned empirically as anecdotal. They tend to speak a language common in Washington but not specifically shared by the rest of us. They talk about programs and policy and how to implement them or it, about trade-offs and constituencies and positioning the candidate and distancing the candidate about the story and how it will play. They speak of a candidate's performance, by which they usually mean his skill at circumventing questions, not as citizens, but as professional insiders attuned to signals pitched beyond the range of normal hearing. I hear he did all right this afternoon, they were saying to one another in the press section of the Louisiana Superdome in New Orleans on the evening in August of 1988, when Dan Quayle was or is not going to be nominated for the vice presidency. I hear he did okay with Brinkley. By the time the balloons fell that night, the narrative had changed. Quayle, zip, the professionals were saying as they brushed the confetti off their laptops.
Far between sundown's finish and midnight's broken toll, we ducked inside the doorway. Thunder was crashing as majestic bells of bolts struck shadows in the sounds. Seeming to be the chimes of freedom flashing, flashing for the warriors whose strength is not to fight, flashing for the refugees on the unnamed road of flight. And for each and every underdog soldier in the night, and we gazed upon the chimes of freedom flashing. In the city's melted furnace, unexpectedly. Watched with faces hidden while the walls were tightening, as the echo of the wedding bells before the blowing rain dissolves into the bells of the lightning. Tolling for the rebel, tolling for the rake, tolling for the luckless, the abandoned and forsaken, tolling for the outcast, burning constantly at stake, and we gazed upon. The chimes of freedom flashing. Through the mad, mystic hammering of the wild, ripping hail, the sky cracked its poems in naked wonder that the clinging. Of the church bells blew far into the breeze, leaving only bells of lightning and thunder, striking for the gentle, striking for the kind, striking for the guardians and. Protectors of the mind, and the poet and the painter left behind and far behind, and we gazed upon the chimes of freedom flashing. Tales and the hypnotic spattered mist was slowly lifting. Electric light still struck like arrows fired on, condemned to drift or else be kept from drifting. Tolling for the searching ones on their speechless seeking trail, for the lonesome hearted lovers with too personal a tale, and for each unharmful gentle and misplaced inside a jail. Gazed upon the chimes of freedom.
flashing Starry-eyed and laughing As I recall when we were caught Trapped by no track of ours For they hang suspended As we listened one last time And we watched with one last look Spellbound and swallowed Till the tolling ended Tolling for the aching ones Whose wounds cannot be nursed For the countless confused, accused, misused Strung out ones and worse And for every hung up person in the whole wide universe And we gazed upon the chimes of freedom flashing And she gazed upon the chimes of freedom flashing Joan I just wanted to thank you all for coming and particularly to also thank those who read and spoke and played music. It was a wonderful evening and Joan, I think, is enjoying it enormously. Thank you. <laughs>